Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello and welcome to the PC Podcast. My name is Chris Judge, class of 2005 and producer of the PC Podcast. In this week's episode, we wanted to share a presentation by His Eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York. As part of PC's theological exchange between Catholics and Jews, Cardinal Dolan's presentation, Jewish-Catholic Dialogue, 2,000 Years But Just Beginning, discussed Nostra Aetate, the Second Vatican Council's document that opened relations between the Catholic Church and non-Christian religions. Cardinal Dolan's sense of humor and insight into this important part of faith did not disappoint the Full House crowd at St. Dominic Chapel, and we hope you enjoy. Uh, Bishop Evans and Father Shanley, Dr. Urbano, and my brothers in the ministry, dear priests and rabbis, consecrated religious women and men, the faculty of this prestigious university, our Jewish guests and friends, one and all. Thank you, thank you very much for your gracious invitation and your warm welcome. Look at this crowd. Uh, I don't know about our Jewish friends, but we Catholics would call this a two-collection crowd. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Father Shanley's already up. <laughs> oh. as, um, as one who has benefited personally from Dominican wisdom, in my own priestly formation, and as a pastor who is now blessed in New York to have the vigorous presence of Dominican sisters, brothers, and priests, my time with you this evening on this beautiful Dominican campus is a gift that I savor very, very much. Now look, everybody, let's get one thing straight. You gotta believe me that I am far from an expert in the blessed enterprise of the Jewish-Catholic dialogue we all now relish, an enterprise that has been so enhanced by this university and this lecture series. I sure enjoy our interreligious efforts. I certainly take them seriously, and I've been heavily involved in them, both as Archbishop of Milwaukee and, and now of New York. Uh, as uh, Dr. Urbano mentioned my work as co-chair of the Jewish, the National Jewish Catholic um, Dialogue would be an especially, uh, um, uh, for me, an especially privileged moment. And I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Rabbi Wayne Franklin, who serves in that dialogue as, uh, as well, is with me this evening. My friendship with the Jewish community in New York is especially exhilarating. I can't take credit for it. My predecessor set it up. In fact, all New Yorkers love telling the story about Francis Cardinal Spellman, my, one of my predecessors who was well known for his business and real estate acumen. Early on, right after Nostra Aetate, uh, Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, the, the renowned uh, Jewish leader in New York, invited Cardinal Spellman to his synagogue to speak, which was thought of as a very revolutionary occasion. And Rabbi Tannenbaum said, Your Eminence Cardinal Spellman, you are very welcome. And he said, There's one thing I can't figure out. He said, You are wearing a red yarmulke, and your congregation's in the black. I'm wearing a black one, and mine's in the red, all right? <laughs> <laughs> if I have any proficiency in this field, it has come from the School of Hard Knocks not from any academic training. Our gathering this evening, folks, on this feast of a Dominican saint, Martin de Porres, is particularly providential as we're still basking in last year's golden jubilee of that inspired document Father Shanley spoke of, that document of the Second Vatican Council, Nostra Aetate a teaching that dramatically transformed Jewish-Catholic relations, thanks be to God. We Catholics sometimes quip that our Jewish neighbors pay a lot more attention to Vatican statements than we do, but both of us, thank God, have paid immense attention to Nostra Aetate, and I would maintain, because of it, our friendship 
it has never been better. Now, the pontiff, the pontiff, the pope, for over 50% of the 51 years since that inspired document, was Pope, now Saint, John Paul II, for whom the worldwide Jewish community has a deep reverence. I worked on this talk 11 days ago on October 22nd. That was his feast day. And what I'd like to do for the next 40 minutes or so is to focus on his monumental role in bringing Nostra Aetate to fruition. Four months after his death, in April of 2005, I had the privilege of traveling with four other bishops from the United States and about a half dozen rabbis on a very moving trip to Israel, Poland, and Rome. In the Eternal City, we were running late, and our guide announced that because we were going to be tardy for our appointment at the synagogue of Rome, we would have to skip our prayer at the tomb of John Paul II. The hell we are, and I quote, <laughs> protested the six rabbis. And to stand, to stand before his tomb in St. Peter's Basilica, bishops and rabbis, hands joined, eyes moistened, was a pinnacle of our pilgrimage. Now, look, what immediately comes to mind when we consider uh, John Paul II and his friendship with the Jews would be two things. One would be the theological advances, the theological advances in Jewish Catholic understanding. And two would be the candid dialogue over the neuralgic issues that arose during his 26 and a half year pontificate. This um, prestigious locus of Jewish Catholic dialogue, Providence College, would be well aware of the first, John Paul's theological inv invitation that we Jews and Christians would now return to the conversation that had been rudely interrupted in 70 AD when Roman soldiers leveled Jerusalem, scattering both Jews and Christians in a diaspora that is still with us, and take up again such profound questions as covenant, election, Israel's special and unique place in God's revelation, the law, and how the two of us are to relate as children of Abraham and people of the book. The acceptance of that invitation from John Paul has resulted in a promising flourishing of Jewish Catholic scholarship, the event this evening, only one such example. Likewise, likewise are we all cognizant of those retroactive issues that the Polish Pope never dodged. Tender topics, remember, such as those Good Friday prayers, the somber and tragic legacy of Christian anti-Semitism, the role of the Holy See, during the Shoah, Vatican diplomatic recognition of the state of Israel, or even flashy episodes like the proposed cross and convent at Auschwitz, the movie The Passion of the Christ, and the visit of Kurt Waldheim to the Vatican. Instead of elaborating on those two admittedly worthwhile areas, I would dare suggest to you this evening that Pope John Paul II realized the dream of Nostra Aetate in a much more substantive and innovative way. Namely, by trusting the Jewish community enough to invite them into what was indeed the number one priority of his pontificate to recover the primacy of the spiritual to recover the primacy of the spiritual. Simply put, everybody, John Paul II believed that the most mortal toxin infecting the human project was the denial of God's sovereignty, the denial even of his existence, and that the church's most natural ally in facing this challenge were the Jews. Humanity's preference of late to get along just fine without God, to use Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's definition of secularism, was deadly. 
and must be reversed. The Pope believed that the Jewish community would share his sense of urgency. Let me try to explain. See, um, John Paul II took literally the dictum of the Hebrew psalmist that only in God is my soul at rest. And that, as our common scriptures reveal unremittingly, any attempt to seek absolute peace, meaning, or purpose in anyone or anything else besides the one true God was a recipe for chaos, chaos and frustration. It was Billy Graham who would observe that the revival of humanity's empty and exhausted soul became John Paul's primary mission. And this pontiff was convinced that our elder brothers and sisters, as he called the Jewish community, were among our most valued partners in this endeavor. He, he came upon this drive to recover the primacy of the spiritual very naturally. The high-octane Catholicism of his beloved Poland saw God's design and presence everywhere. Poland's own tragic history had taught the young Karol Wojtyla that faith alone would never fail, even when all else did as it had. His Poland had literally been erased from maps in the 19th century and while its status may have been restored after World War I, it was left in the dirt. So young Karavitiya turned to the Hebrew Psalms. Whoever trusts in God is like Mount Zion, unshakable, it stands forever. He himself, he himself had lost everything. His mother, his sister, his brother a physician who succumbed to an epidemic in Krakow while treating others, and his father by the time he was in his early 20s. With the rest of Poland, he described how he cried as he watched the Luftwaffe swarm over his country on September 1st, 1939, and lived in daily peril for six bleak years, watching Jewish friends and his own classmates in the secret seminary in the basement of the Cardinal Archbishop's house disappear nightly. In fact, early one morning, coming home from work in the chemical factory in the suburbs of Krakow on a very frozen night, he himself was hit by a truckload of drunken Nazi soldiers and left for dead on the side of the road. Things didn't get better in 1945, did they? as Poland lost the world twice, when the jackboots of Hitler's thugs were replaced by those of Stalin's, as the climate of enforced, oppressive living without God continued to smother Poland. What got the people of Poland through? The faith of Jewish and Christian wisdom. Only in God is my soul at rest. Is it any wonder why his first words on the balcony of St. Peter's were those repeated so often by the God of Israel and by his son Jesus, be not afraid? Now here's the most radiant illustration of John Paul's strategy to recover the primacy of faith. Coming during what has been called those nine days that changed the world, when he returned to Poland <clears throat> at the beginning of June 1979, remember? Henry Kissinger would claim he then did for Poland what Churchill had done for England. Mikhail Gorbachev would later conclude that those nine days were the beginning of the end of communist hegemony, a hammer and sickle which had especially been used against Catholics and Jews. On the final day of that historic visit, in Victory Square in Warsaw, before two million Poles, he began to deliver at Mass what all somberly felt would probably be his last public address ever in his homeland. He had only spoken a few moments when the three-word chant began. It started in a corner, 
and soon tsunamied over the throng. As two million Poles shouted the same three words. What were those three words? Down with communism? Uh uh. Russia go home? Nope. The three words were we want God. We want God. It went on for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. We want God. <coughs> His nervous Monsignor attendant whispered, Holy Father, perhaps you might want to hush the crowd so you can finish your sermon, only to have John Paul look at him and smile as if to say, Are you crazy? This is why I came. <laughs> we want God. The primitive cry of faith, of belief, of humanity's innate longing for the divine, a thirst denied, ignored, ridiculed, outlawed, and reasoned away for too long by the lies of a society and culture that had vainly sought purpose in systems and men mentalities that forgot God. It, it, it was as if John Paul's visit to his beloved homeland had put on the lips of his people, the pining of the Hebrew psalmist, like a deer that thirsts for living water, so my soul longs for you, my God. The twisted, distorted cross of Nazism was straightened out. The hammer and sickle of Lenin and Stalin became a plowshare. We want God. That, of course, my friends, is the quintessential cry of Israel. And John Paul II saw today's children of Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Moses, David, and the prophets as essential to the recovery of the primacy of the divine in a world drugged to forget the Lord. John Henry Newman had worried a century prior to that shout in Warsaw that we now live in a world that is simply irreligious. The leading, the leading Peritus on the life of John Paul II, George Weigel, tells us that the Pope looked right into the eyes of this deformation of the great humanistic project in which the God of the Hebrew and Christian Bible came to be regarded as the enemy of human maturation and liberation, and did not blink, observes Weigel. In the pervasive worldview of atheistic humanism, secularism, created by such thinkers as Comte, Feuerbach, Marx, and Nietzsche, biblical religion was the enemy, for it impeded the progress of humanity. Thus, moderns must free themselves from the constraints of faith, that it might march boldly into a bright, humane future, freed from those shackles imposed on it by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <coughs> no wonder, no wonder Solzhenitsyn could conclude that the horrors of World War I and II could have only happened because humanity had forgotten God. John Paul's cause then was to rally Christians and Jews together to shout out, we want God. For what had been squandered was a sense of awe at the very mystery of God, a, a mystery at the soul of Judaism and Christianity. Our, our visions had been blotted, skepticism and Cynicism dominate our discourse. All is at the mercy of manipulation by our self-willfulness. And the pleasure principle has ended up robbing us of joy. Man had become a puzzle for technicians to solve instead of a mystery for poets to love and embrace. Nostra Aetate tells us that all peoples comprise a single community, and have a single origin. One also is their final goal, Almighty God. His providence, his goodness, 
His saving designs extend to all. A couple years ago, I was honored to host at my house behind St. Patrick's Cathedral the, the chief rabbi of Rome, Riccardo di Segni, for lunch. He was so excited as he shared with me what was then a secret, the intentions of Pope Francis to visit the synagogue in Rome as Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul II had. He tenderly recalled the visit of John Paul to the synagogue in 1986 when the Pope called Jews and Christians to a, quote, collaboration in favor of humanity. For Jews and Christians, our belief in God has certain implications, which John Paul believed impel Jews and Christians to work together. This is indeed a collaboration in favor of humanity. One such implication would be our insistence on the dignity of the human person, created according to Genesis in God's very image and likeness, made, so says the psalmist, little less than a God. Two would be the sanctity of every human life, Never a means to an end, but an end in itself. A third is a trust in reason as an ally to faith, a theme that would be taken up vigorously by John Paul's successor, Benedict XVI. You see, both Jews and Catholics see faith and reason as friends, not enemies. If mind and soul are not in harmony, our two, tradition, our two traditions agree, we risk either the dictatorship of relativism on the side of narcissistic rationalism or a bloody fundamentalism at the other extreme of superstitious fetism. Four would be, would be an allegiance to God's law, truths, as John Paul commented at Mount Sinai, written on the human heart before being engraved in stone, not to be contradicted by self-will or popular demand. Five would be solidarity, a sense that we're all in this together and that we're much better off sticking together and looking out for each other than we are locked up in our own comfort zones. Six would be the conviction that faith, while deeply personal, is never private. Our interior convictions, Jews and Catholics hold, have social, public implications. Our religion is not confined to the sanctuary of the parish or the bima of the synagogue, but spills out to the public square. This is a theme dramatically, indefatigably trumpeted by Pope Francis, who sees the implications of our Judeo-Christian ethic in our outreach to the poor, the refugee, the protection of the environment, just to name a few. <coughs> seventh, the seventh implication of our working together would be a mutual worldview. You see, Jews and Catholics share the same glasses. Simply put, history is his story for a Christian or a Jew. The history of salvation in which Jews and Christians believe is, in fact, the history of the world. Both John Paul II and Rabbi Joshua Heschel would remind us that coincidence is the term that nonbelievers employ instead of providence a term I use joyfully on this campus. And like Heschel, evident, oh, thanks. Do you have an olive to put in it? No, 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 no. Afterwards, all right. And like Heschel, everybody, evident in the title of his great book, John Paul II was convinced that the human story is not so much the recounting of our search for God, but of God's search for us. So, Pope John Paul II would become a pilgrim 
like Abraham, reminding the world of its real story, its genuine identity as God's creation, unfolding according to his plan and providence, the story of Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. This optic common to Jews and Christians makes us, as John Paul commented often, a blessing to one another. Together we share our eyeglasses with others so that all can see history to be his story. That human dignity and life are enhanced, not shackled, when we proclaim we want God. That each of us is called to renew the exodus, allowing the Lord to free us from slavery and death to freedom and life as we celebrate every Passover and Easter. It was Theodore Herzl a century ago who understood that anti-Semitism is proof that something is seriously flawed in the culture of the West. George Weigel again. When the fever chant of anti-Semitism spikes upward, it's always the sign that the patient is in mortal danger, in no small part because it has forgotten the biblical roots of the Western civilizational enterprise. For the foundational Western metaphor of freedom and human liberation is not the Enlightenment, but the Exodus. And the exodus is a liberation completed by a moral code intended to help the free rid themselves of the habits of slaves, the bad habits that derive from willfulness and self-absorption. <coughs> Aleo Toaf, who was chief rabbi of Rome when John Paul visited the synagogue on the Tiber River, died a couple years ago, remember? Pope John Paul II, did you know this? Pope John Paul II mentioned only two men in his brief last will and testament. He thanked his loyal priest secretary, Stanislaw Jivich, and he thanked Rabbi Eleo Toef. No wonder. Karol Wojtyla and Eleo Toef, a Catholic and a Jew, were two men who sensed the groans of their century in their guts, and who believed that only by placing God first and entrusting and respecting one another can we get back on the path to God instead of remaining a dead-end road of forgetting or denying Him. Our project of Together asking those deep theological questions of election, covenant, revelation, messianic hope, divine promise, and redemption. Scholarly questions Jews and Christians now both probe together are of facing those social and cultural challenges we confront, such as ominous anti-Semitism, our systematic persecution of Christians, all start with our mutual chant, so innate in the fiber of Jews and Christians, we want God. We need God. Dominant cultural attempts to sideline him, reject him, deny him, ignore him, run from him, or mock him, <laughs> only lead to trouble. In this era, when faith is being reduced to an innocuous hobby or superstition at best, to a cause of bigotry, backwardness, and violence at worst, to confess we want God is nothing less than prophetic. So that's my plug this evening, everybody, that Nostra Aetate inspired John Paul II to not just tolerate Jews, not just have theological discussions with them, not just meet with them at times of controversy and neuralgia, as essential as all those were, but to invite them into a providential and urgent partnership 
flowing from mutual faith, love, and biblical roots, where Jews became like their prophets of old, and Catholics like the twelve apostles and the towering saints, in calling the world away from the worship of false idols into the arms of the one true eternal God, who personally and passionately loves us, who has a plan for us, in whom alone we find purpose and peace, and whose providence is sovereign. When I was a boy in fourth grade at Holy Infant Grade School in Baldwin, Missouri, we had as a project to memorize the Ten Commandments. Not a bad project, by the way. The pastor would be in the next day to quiz us. I knew him by heart, or so I thought, until Father Callahan called on me in class to recite them. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Boy, I started fine, <coughs> like the Cleveland Indians. But then... <laughs> I started fine, but then went blank. Was I ever relieved when the pastor said, Well, Tim, that's the most important one. All the others flow from that one. <laughs> John Paul II would agree. Jews, I think, would agree. Catholics certainly would. And Nostra Aetate. 51 years old, just a baby to a Jew or a Christian, would agree and urge us to work together to teach it to a world which now sadly tends to go hoarse when inspired to shout, we want God. Thank you. <clears throat>